if you could join us on this webinar today um, on uh, developing an online education program for your residency program. I know that uh, many of you are meeting with challenges at your local institutions and appreciate you taking a little bit of time out this afternoon to learn about educational resources that we have built in with the CNS and have developed over the past couple weeks to help you respond and continue with resident education. Um, our group today uh, consists of uh, myself, Garni Barkadorian, uh, Lola Chambliss, Akash Patel, and Mariam Rahman. And uh, we're going to each speak a little bit differently about um, uh, various things that you can do to develop an educational curriculum for your residency program. Uh, first, I'd like to thank, um, uh, obviously, the folks at CNS headquarters who have assembled this uh, webinar on the fly, as well as um, uh, set up the website for our grand rounds and, and uh, virtual visiting professor that you'll hear about a little bit later as well. And I want to especially thank the CNS Foundation for sponsoring all of this so that we can make it free, not only for our own residency programs within the United States, but also internationally. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lola Chambliss from Vanderbilt. Great, thank you. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up, I think. Oh. Yep, I'm changing them to Dr. Chambliss's slides. They should be up right now. Okay. While we're waiting on those, I'll apologize to everybody that we are uh, we did put this together on the fly really quickly given the changing situation. So we're working hard to there we go to make sure that we get you this information. But uh, we may have a few minor hiccups like that as we go today. Um, so I just wanted to open briefly uh, by outlining the issues that we're trying to address. We are obviously all dealing with a rapidly changing fluid landscape in terms of our own clinical practices and the way that we are using our resident workforce. Our goal as the education division at the CNS um, is to try to help support programs to maintain the health and readiness of our residents uh, and also allow us to continue to fulfill our educational mission and requirements as we're all obviously unsure how long this situation may last. Uh, we know from what we've learned from countries that are a little bit ahead of us in this pandemic that minimizing exposure for healthcare workers is key. And I'm sure that uh, virtually all of you, if not all of you, have already moved uh, into a system where we're doing this differently. This includes obviously social distancing. Uh, most of us are experiencing cancellations of conferences or cancellations of any kind of group meetings that occur in involving a group of more than a few people. Uh, and many of us are looking at a clinical coverage change that I think in most institutions is going to go to more of a shift-based approach, which may mean that the timing of didactics that we have traditionally been used to uh, is going to need to be altered for at least the short term. Uh, the needs that we've assessed uh, are for high quality educational materials that are accessible to individuals where they are that don't require them coming to a group location uh, and then include both live interactive products uh, but also on-demand products for people who aren't necessarily able to access our products at the moment uh, that most of their institution can. So we're lucky in one way uh, in that the requirements from the ACGME in terms of what we must do as program directors uh, are really quite flexible uh, and there are, are not a lot of rigid instructions for us in terms of, of what we must provide. When we pull a number of different programs, there are a lot of different models out there in terms of how didactics are run. 
For example, there are programs that run an education day each week um, where they spend hours together as a group. There are also other programs that have multiple one or two hour conferences throughout the week, often early in the morning. There are, um, most programs have some conferences that are resident only or resident run and they just have one faculty member supervising periodically uh, versus obviously departmental conferences like M&M and Grand Rounds versus multidisciplinary conferences. And so we've got to look at a way that we're approaching all of those different uh, needs in different ways. We all likely run literature based journal clubs um, that may be something that's separate from our grand rounds type experience. And then we also all need the opportunity for independent learning based on where residents are in their own training curriculum. Uh, I think one thing that we're going to be looking at certainly in my institution is a, a greater reliance on use of self assessment tools in this time where we're not able to be interacting with every single resident every day and getting a, a live sense of where their learning is. So I'm going to pause uh, from talking about it from the program director standpoint and turn it over to Garney, who's going to give you guys an introduction to what CNS has online right now that may fill some of these needs. So, um... Can you hear me okay? Uh, before Garney speaks, I'd like to just interject. interject. Uh, this is Ashok Estegari again. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, what you can do at your own program. Give me one second here. Uh, about video teleconferencing. Can you all see that video teleconferencing screen now? Megan, can I be the presenter? Yes, it's okay. coming your way. Okay, great. So, uh, you know, video teleconferencing, I think, is it, obviously you're all engaged in it right now as we speak and obviously are learning about some of the hiccups as well. But it certainly um, is, is the tool of the future, I think, not only for this, but also to replace, um, you know, the necessity for face to face meetings all the time. Obviously, there is. Uh, significant gain by interpersonal communication and getting together and actually meeting face to face, but that can't always happen. And there are numerous products now. Um, originally, when we first started doing teleconferencing, it was all really you had to have a setup, a very specific setup that you would cost about $10,000 on either side, usually made by Cisco or Tanberg. But now, uh, you know, there are so many platforms that do essentially the same thing and require the exact same type of hardware and software. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands what's available to help you as residency programs try to utilize some of this content even locally. So up here you have four different examples. One is Zoom, the second is um, Chime, third is WebEx, and, uh, and, and the fourth is um, uh, WebEx, Chime, Zoom, I forget the other one. Uh, but, um, you know, each of them have the exact same things. They can share a presentation like we're doing. You can see web cameras of, of everybody who's involved if you so choose. You can just share the presenters' video cameras as well. And then there's a chat box usually somewhere where questions can come up from the audience. The issue with all of this, obviously, is it's um, even difficult sometimes for us to be able to navigate this easily, and it's, it's, it's really nice if we have three distinct entities who are participating. The first, obviously, is, is, a, is a group of presenters, um, and typically one person only needs to host or own the account in order to be able to do video teleconferencing. Once they set up the video teleconference like you all did, you'd receive an email. And it's very nice to have a moderator present. Uh, we have Megan Fogelson from the CNS, as well as Christy Angelos from the CNS helping us today about um, organizing the different slide sets and sort of toggling between and letting multiple speakers share their information. Obviously, I just showed you on the previous slide, there's many software programs to choose from. And really the only person who is, is uh, landlocked to their presentation or desktop PC is, are the folks who are actually doing the presentations. Everyone else, all of these software programs run on iPhones, 
Samsung devices and uh, uh, iPads and other things. So they're completely portable and there, there are ways to engage the audience either through text, through chatting or polling. And um, uh, you know, the hardware needs are fairly basic. Communication, as, as we have discussed, um, one thing that's really important is that usually uh, it's one way. So the speaker is presenting like we are right now, and we generally, participants are kept on mute until there's a question and answer session. Or the moderator fields questions through the chat room and then presents them to the panelists for discussion. So, you know, this seems like a pretty big task for folks to organize, and obviously that's why we have the infrastructure of the CNS helping us uh, do this even today. And I'd like to take, uh, turn this over to Dr. Rahman to talk a little bit about some of the programs we have that are utilizing this software. Thanks, Ashok. I'm just going to... Um wait to see if I can get my slides up. Uh, but while those are coming up, the immediate response that the CNS has had uh, for um, the uh, COVID uh, crisis is to, we've um, worked very hard over the past uh, couple of weeks under Ashok's uh, leadership to basically uh, uh, provide the pre-recorded webinars that are part of the CNS catalog for free to serve as a grand rounds type um, platform for programs to use for educational purposes. And what we're um, doing now is this is now, if you go to the CNS main website, um, you will see it uh, there. Um, and here on, on this slide, you can see there it says Grand Rounds, and there are three um, uh, webinars there that are available for free. And we're planning on having two to three topics each week, and then those will rotate off, uh, and there'll be new topics listed. And so you could potentially um, replace uh, two to three um, hours of conference with these webinars. And um, because of the versatility of the platform, like Ashok said, you, you could uh, assign it to the uh, residents or fellows and they could watch these on their phones uh, and maintain their social distancing. Uh, and um, there's no password um, login required to access these. And so um, that has been um, something that we've been able to kind of mobilize very quickly um, given the, um, the, the COVID crisis. If you look on the right of the slide, uh, that's, um, you can see uh, just a tentative schedule of our planned uh, webinars. And it, what we're really trying to do is to uh, represent a wide spectrum of topics, um, both subspecialty-wise um, and as well as you know, surgical versus medical management. Uh, and um, we're going to be rotating those um, each week. Um, Ashok or Megan, anything to add to that? Okay, I can go to the next slide. Um, and then uh, the other um, part of our solution is actually um, live conferences. So the webinars um, that are up now that you can access today um, are free and they're all pre recorded. Uh, but we also uh, plan on um, within the next couple of weeks of starting live webinars that will serve as virtual visiting professors. Uh, many institutions, including my own at the University of Florida, we've had to cancel our visiting uh, professors um, who are scheduled to come in the spring or in the summer. And so um, what we envision is that these uh, live conferences will serve as a virtual visiting professor and can replace those visits. And um, we want to cover a wide amount of subspecialty topics. Um, these are going to be experts in um, either neurosurgery or neurointensive care or neuro-oncology. Um, they're all topics that are important for residency education. We're planning on having about one a week and the timings will vary because these are going to be live. Um, we do want to be able to provide services to programs throughout the different time zones. And so we're going to try to match up the speakers with their own time zones. At the same time, they will get recorded. And so if you miss it and then want to use it just as a grand rounds recorded video, you'll be able to do that. They'll be placed online for review. And um, the, because of the live format, it will allow for an interactive conference with question and answer periods so um, that we can create some of the intimacy that you get from the virtual visiting professor where residents would have access um, to experts in neurosurgery and be able to interact with them and ask questions. Uh, and we're planning on finalizing the schedule in terms of the topics, particular speakers, and when these will be held 
by next week, and then that will be available on the CNS website. Yeah, Miriam, I think we're really excited about, um, you know, this virtual visiting professor in addition to the webinars, because I think it's, it's really a, a way to refine quite possibly not only conferences during this time where everybody needs to be in social isolation but or social distancing, but also um, maybe in the future as well, just to have three, four, five departments link up and um, maybe have a real good speaker. You have a good speaker at one institution to talk about skull base. You know, why do we need to replicate that in 10 different departments, you know, at the same time, everybody on the East Coast, whoever has a 7 a.m. conference on Wednesday or Thursday, we will try to get this organized and appreciate all the feedback. I know there's uh, a lot of folks who are on this webinar. Uh, we're up to about 87 folks on the webinar now, so a lot of interest from many residency programs that are going to participate in this and hopefully we can um, all work together not only during this time, uh, but we've we've had a uh, a big interest from nominations for visiting professors that want to participate in this already, and we're quite excited about having these keynote speakers starting next week. Thanks for organizing that, Miriam. Uh, next, uh, we're going to talk, you know, going beyond just the webinar. So we've talked about. These, these pre recorded webinars that you can do for two or three hours a week. Um, and then we talked about the virtual visiting professor, which can also help provide more didactics. Uh, but I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Garni uh, Barkadarian to go through uh, what else we have online with regards to CNS educational material. And, and um, I'll turn it over to him to talk about some of the other educational products that we've made over the years, many of which are completely free to your residents. And so um, we would encourage them to utilize that resource and join, and I'll show you all how to do that later. Thank you, Garner. Uh, th thank you, Ashok, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I just want to preface everything I say that uh, all of the educational content that the CNS has produced uh, comes from a, a lot of hard work from our CNS volunteers and CNS staff, uh, only a few of which are listed here, uh, but uh, uh, really, uh, truly a, a strong effort over many, many years. Uh, and this is what we have to offer. So this is our overall kind of a 30,000 foot overview of our educational platforms that are online and digital. This is of course excluding live courses, which uh, is on hold for the time being. So uh, Maria mentioned uh, webinars, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we also have self-assessment in neurological surgery, digital content, which includes Case of the Month, Nexus, Journal Club podcasts, and other journal-related uh, 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 content, and also our mobile app platforms, and I'll go over those really briefly. So, the CNS recorded webinars, currently we have uh, over 35 pre-recorded webinars available uh, for our, our membership. And of course, for our residents, these are, are free. Uh, they're typically 60 to 90 minutes long, often with multiple faculty. So if that time frame doesn't fit within your, your scheduled time with your residents, uh, one can divide those up as seen fit. Um, the topics cover all the core subspecialties, uh, spine, tumor, vascular trauma, and also some uh, one-offs, uh, including things that you may have seen on the list from Dr. Rahman, including things like burnout and interdisciplinary management, et cetera. It's applicable to all stages of training from the medical student level through residents and also for fellows as well. And uh, as Dr. Rahman mentioned, there'll be a, a rotating weekly curriculum a menu, so to speak, of, of what we have to offer that we think would be a good uh, protocol for your residency program. With regards to self-assessment, uh, the SANS products uh, have become a lot more robust over the last few years. Uh, specifically, we have focused a lot on the resident education and, and the rotations that they are working on, and we've generated seven different modules, as you can see on the left of the screen, that uh, would address any resident that, if you do have a, a, um, a rotation specific to that type of subspecialty, or if you want to assess their uh, capabilities within 
a specific topic, one could take a test and examination and, and see where they are. And this could be useful in a, in a grand round type setting where you have an examination after a certain topic or just for assessment along the lines. And from a broader perspective, we do have a written boards module bundle, which includes the webinars and the uh, SANS examinations. And finally, we do have the SANS indications exam, which is really for our graduating residents who are going off and are preparing for their oral, oral boards. And this is really focusing on the type of questions one would expect as they're starting a practice and need, need to know how to manage patients and which patients to offer surgery and which to observe or, or have conservative management. This is an example of a typical question in SANS, and I think the value in SANS is really in the critique after one's answer is seen, where one can see exactly why the answer is correct and, and how, it, uh, how the incorrect uh, responses are incorrect and learn from that. So it's not just whether they got the answer right or wrong, but uh, a lot more robust, and there's some links to link out to different uh, references and other educational uh, resources. The case of the month has been widely uh, popular. It is a free uh, resource that the CNS offers. Uh, and uh, if you've been on the CNS mailing list, you've seen these emails come through your inbox um, with the uh, case of the month uh, that you have the opportunity to answer questions. And uh, again, similar to SANS, there's a discussion with the answers explained. And this is a good uh, opportunity, uh, particularly in a, in, a grant, uh, in a residence weekly uh, uh, setting to go over a certain case and then uh, do a deeper dive into that uh, type of pathology. Going along those lines is CNS Nexus. So this has been a, a monumental um, undertaking uh, by our, uh, some of our predecessors and Dr. Asagiri, uh, and currently run by Dr. Rahman, and really uh, focusing on uh, short case vignettes, locally, um, discussing basically the indications, but also intraoperative issues like positioning, incision, uh, how the incision is made, some surgical adjuncts, surgical techniques with some video and images uh, in, in surgery and post-operative management. And this, we have over 400 cases spanning the different uh, topics that you can see here. It's very robust and you can see multiple ways to skin a cat here. And it, it really only takes five or 10 minutes to go through a case and, and it'll be a great opportunity in case preparation, but also for evaluation, say for m and with regards to our journal-related digital content, we basically have three platforms. We have the Journal Club podcast, which are, um, and I have the links here, and we'll, we'll send out resources for that as well. But the, the podcasts are monthly discussions with an author, usually the senior author of a particular article published in um, neurosurgery or, or one of its uh, sub-journals, uh, as well as a guest faculty and a moderator. And there's a post quiz available. So it, as uh, Dr. Chambliss was mentioning, if you are running a journal club, this would be a great opportunity to identify uh, a, an interesting topic and also hear the perspectives from the authors. Neurosurgery Watch takes us outside uh, neurosurgery proper and uh, looks at uh, publications across many, many journal platforms, including things like Neuro New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, Lancet, et cetera, and uh, really trying to identify what's out there and uh, bring some relevant content back uh, based on a topic per topic basis. And finally, seeing a spotlight is uh, again tied to the neurosurgery and operative sur neurosurgery journals and identifies a key article that we think is of important discussion points and also has some relevant uh, previously published uh, articles and uh, we link out to various educational resources such as Nexus uh, for the, that as well. And finally, mobile applications. Um, we have, for both iOS and Android platforms, three mobile platforms, uh, three applications. The first is the SANS boards, which is basically a question bank for the written boards, very helpful for people preparing for the examination once it goes back online. Uh, second is the CNS Guidelines app. And this is a very nice resource that I think can be used within residency and beyond for um, most of the CNS published guidelines across multiple subspecialties. And finally, the Neurosurgery Survival Guide is uh, amongst residents thought to be a, a must-have resource. It really is an excellent resource to the basic neurosurgical knowledge for the wards and case preparation. And we're in the 
currently in the process of updating it and having it even more robust, so we'll see some changes in that in, in the next few months. And so this is a, a, basically a timeline that we've uh, looked at uh, and recommended for program coordinators and directors, uh, what options we have at different uh, stages of training. We'll circulate this with the program directors and coordinators um, in due time, but this is basically how we see certain of our educational resources can be utilized in the medical student, junior resident, senior resident, and chief resident and, and fellow levels. Um, so with that, uh, Ashoka, I'll pass the baton back to you. Thank you. Chuck, you're muted. Doctor. Sorry, I think uh, the last few slides that you've been showing with regards to, um, you know, the spreadsheets with regards to where the different resources are, are more applicable to certain years in residency, all of that material is going to be sent out, um, uh, I believe, in the, in the coming weeks here, next couple of weeks, so that it's in a more digestible format. But we just wanted to sort of give the understanding that there's a lot of material, I think, that is available online for consumption, you know, and, and obviously when we have the didactics and we're sitting around in our usual institutions and, you know, our home institutions and receiving lectures and we're just sort of set in our ways, I don't think a lot of folks know about the existence of all of this, you know, but I think you can see very easily how uh, as a program director or a coordinator sort of sifting through things I don't think it's necessary to generate all of this content. You know, it's widely available. And I just wanted to take, um, you know, even though we, we've shown all of this, I wanted to take just a minute to show um, um, sort of how we can, where all of this is on the website, you know. So I think you can see our website now, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and so if, this is just cns.org, and, and we have placed the uh, grand round section right front and center so that if you uh, just remember, if you remember nothing at all, just cns.org will get you here. But since this is primarily about resident training opportunities and, and learning, um, I'm just going to scroll down just a little bit so that you see uh, where there's a resident section. It's also up here in the, in the menu bar. But if you go down to the resident section, it's got it um, nicely collated for all of the resident resources. Um, as you know, the membership obviously is completely complimentary for residents, so uh, many of the tools, as I said, are free. Um, but also there's you know, a listing for online education here, but also our main applications that we talked about today, including Nexus. Neurosurgery Survival Guide, SANS, and the Guidelines app. You know, listen, uh, links to Journal Club podcasts, they're all sort of right on that same resident area. And so I'd encourage you all to uh, utilize some of these products that are in existence already. Um, I'm going to turn it back over now to Lola. Uh, Megan, is that something you can do so that she can talk about maybe how to utilize some of these things to design a curriculum for your residency program? Thanks, Ashok. Um, while Megan's pulling that up, I'll say, you know, what I hoped to do with the last couple minutes here is, is just to talk through how I'm thinking about this as a program director based on the way that we run our program, but also conversations with my colleagues or program directors elsewhere, and, and just give you guys a couple of initial thoughts about how you might incorporate all of this material we've shown you today. Um, first of all, you know, we've, we've really discussed two essential options for replacing our typical lectures. And this is what I see as replacements for, you know, grand rounds and really departmental conferences. Um, the reason we're doing this in two different ways is that there are complementary benefits and challenges with each of these formats. Uh, when you have a live lecture, uh, obviously you guys have benefit, all the trainees are seeing the same material. You've got the opportunity to interact with questions, which is something that we're really going to be working hard to facilitate because we think that's the, one of the major benefits of this format. And of course, residents can engage from any computer anywhere um, and certainly don't need to all be in the same room. 
Of course, on the downside, these are only available at specific times, and we all know with any grand round, there's always residents and, and faculty that are unavailable at any given time. That may be more of an issue in the coming months as we move to more, uh, at least in my program, more of a shift team uh, type coverage standpoint. Uh, and, and so that's going to pose a few challenges here. It's also going to be difficult, I think, for us to assess training engagement uh, with all of these online lectures. You know, to what extent, if we're assigning these lectures um, to our residents, to what extent are they really participating, thinking through the content, uh, or just letting it slide by? Um, on the other hand, sort of in contrast, um, if I, uh, when we look at the pre-recorded webinars, obviously, again, trainees all see the same material. They can view from any computer. And the key benefit being that they can watch on their own schedule. And so these are things that you can assign for the week and say, find your own time to take care of this. Uh, and then we can get back together and discuss it as a group. Um, obviously, there's no opportunity for interaction or asking questions. And again, assessing trainee engagement is going to be something that we as program directors have to continue to sort out. So my tentative plan for us at Vanderbilt that we're going to institute next week uh, is, a, is a new model curriculum I just wanted to outline here. Uh, we are going to have two weekly online lectures that are mandatory for all residents. Uh, one of those will be an online grand round to be completed on each trainee schedule. One of those will be the virtual visiting professor, um, which will obviously be at an assigned time, understanding that not everyone will be able to participate uh, but we're going to have a, a, a pretty strong bar, a uh, pretty high bar in terms of what we want in terms of actual participation and questions and answers from our residents and those that cannot participate will be required to view that later. Uh, looking at our journal club, as our residents aren't going to be meeting in person for journal club, um, we're going to turn that online and we're going to try using the CNS Spotlight uh, journal club to facilitate as a, as a a method of focusing ourselves for the next couple of weeks, asking all the residents to read the spotlight article, one assigned resident to present the summary of related literature that is easily available when you go to that product um, during a 30 minute web based journal club that will be also facilitated with a faculty in the related subspecialty. Uh, and we're going to look at do, using Nexus in a little bit of a different way. We have typically used Nexus as case preparation. Uh, so when a resident's going to come do a pituitary operation with me. I asked them to review the Nexus case ahead of time uh, and discuss it with me. But we're looking at shifts in terms of what our elective practice is going to look like, uh, and yet our residents still need to understand and have some case-based learning. And I think case-based learning is going to be something they're going to be truly seeking uh, in a setting where they may not be as operatively busy as they're used to. And so what we're going to try is um, picking a couple of cases out of Nexus that are related, uh, assigning them to be reviewed by the residents over the course of a week on their own time, and then having a you know, faculty member lead a web-based case conference discussing that particular topic, their own nuances, et cetera, and perhaps some of their own cases that they might want to uh, display as well. Beyond that, we're going to add one additional program on kind of a weekly rotation. So we're going to, one week, um, ask all the residents to participate in a particular SANS module. The next week, ask everybody to use the Journal Club podcast following week, ask everybody to review the case of the month and have a web-based discussion about that. Um, so we're going to rotate through some of these other products, um, ultimately with the goal that in our program we have, you know, about four to five hours of didactic teaching a week. Uh, and that will keep us in line with what we normally do. Beyond that, the apps are really uh, valuable. All of our residents have the Neurosurgery Survival Guide already and, and should have the Guidelines app as well. Uh, I would strongly suggest programs make those uh, available to all their residents and, uh, and encourage them to use those in their day-to-day -day learning as they're seeing patients, which is where I think that they're uh, far and away the most valuable. Um, I think there's two other considerations to think about, you know, as every program is different. Certainly, one could, one could postulate it might be helpful to kind of have a weekly subspecialty focus versus keep it mixed up. I'm going to lean toward keeping it mixed up because I think that's what is going to keep our residents most engaged. And also, we don't really know how long this type of new novel curriculum is going to be needed. Uh, but I think there's some opportunities in, in you saw uh, that the webinar plans that Miriam presented. For example, there's going to be a weekly webinar working through the endoscopic uh, surgery series. And that may be one thing that we offer um, that, that is kind of a continuous thread 
while then we address other subspecialties within the week with other content. Uh, many of you may have programs where you do a single day of education. We tend to have our uh, work dispersed throughout the week. Um, so obviously program directors will have to think individually about what sort of timeline they expect their residents to complete all of, um, all of this material. Uh, I think it's going to be absolutely critical to try to test and monitor engagement because that's one thing that certainly worries me um, that there's no way for me to know to what extent people are getting truly you know, important information out of um, online activities that they're doing alone. So you might have noticed a lot of what I talked about is asking residents to summarize material and teach it back to each other. We all know that you know, that's one of the keys to adult learning is, is to teach uh, what we are learning. And then holding web-based um, specific discussions using a lot of the platforms that Ashok introduced uh, to go through things like cases. Uh, and also to hold a web-based Q&A after online lectures. So I think that coming up with ways to continue to assess engagement will be critical. SANS is also uh, an easy platform to do that because program directors can um, get a readout of resident performance, which is used not necessarily as a test of resident knowledge in every scenario, but um, you know, as a way of assessing where your residents stand and where the holes are in your own educational curriculum. Uh, that is all that I have to discuss, so I will turn it back over to Ashok uh, to summarize and, um, and see if we have any other points of discussion. Thanks. Yeah, Lola, I think um, one of the other things um, that, that we should mention is that many of you also have medical, you're associated with medical schools as well, and many of them have sent home their students and are looking for curricular materials. You know, if you've had rotating residents, fourth year electives have been canceled for all I know for the next, at least at University of Virginia, they've been canceled for the forthcoming um, until June, I think it is. And so a lot of them are looking for content to review alongside, like what are they missing with regards to didactics. And I think this, um, you know, at least these online grand rounds, there is no password protection on them. And so you just log in and you'll get the three webinars every week. And um, obviously, if, you know, if you become a, uh, one of the questions I think that has come up is uh, becoming a, a resident member of the CNS, how do you actually utilize that? There are, uh, There is a code for logging into the webinars and actually having some questions before and after. It's a more formal process and it's, it's a couple of hurdles, but there are, there are discount codes um, that, that we can provide as well that will make webinars, um, all our existing webinars free for residents as well. Um, I'd like to, uh, there is a chat session on the right side of your screen. Uh, I had mentioned that when, when uh, we went through different types of platforms. And if anybody has questions, we've received a few questions and I think Megan has been answering them. Um, but um, if anyone else has any questions, I'll be happy to stay on the line for another five minutes if you have a question about where something is on a website or even suggestions and other things, please type them up or send us an email and uh, let us know how we can help you uh, uh, develop an online curriculum. Uh, Garni, Lola, and uh, uh, Mariam, thank you so much for taking uh, Friday afternoon and uh, spending a little bit of time with us talking about all of these uh, educational offerings from the CNS. I'll wait here for about five minutes for any questions that Megan brings up. Ashok, uh, there's one question up there now um, from Christina asking whether these slides will be sent to the PDs. Uh, and I think that they will as well as to the program coordinators. Is that correct? And we are recording. We are recording the presentation as well and can make it available online too. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, more than happy to share the slides and um, certainly when, when the webinar is, is live, maybe we can place it as one of the three things for next week as well in case somebody missed it.
there is a question about showing the slide um, for the CNS education resources for PGYs um, four and six, four through six. Okay, uh, am I the presenter right now? Um, yes, I can definitely make you the presenter. Okay, I'll pull that. I think that was uh, Dr. Uh, Garney's slide um, and PGY four to six, I think that's the slide that's up right now. Yes. And this content will be being made available online as well. We are working on um, getting all the PGY um, education pages up. And the code for those of you asking, it's 2020RES. Um, and again, that's any of the residents, medical students um, can utilize that to get the webinars for free. And then again, we do have a new resource page where they can get um, the virtual visiting professor and the online grand rounds content for free as well without even having to log in. And that's going to be cns.org online ed. Um, Uh, Megan, are you still receiving questions at all? Um, the reason I ask is there's still, maybe the folks are just logged in still, but there's still 50 plus people on here and I don't want to leave before answering any questions that folks are still asking. I think I do see another one here. Just give me one moment. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to sit around for a while. Someone is asking if we have any M&M resources. Um, the, um, the issue with M&M resources um, are that uh, they require institutional HIPAA applications to be used. Uh, I know at the University of Virginia we use a WebEx platform and, and I know Lola spoke about her uh, programs, initiatives, and what the outline is going to be. But we here at UVA are planning on using a WebEx platform and maintaining um, uh, the same monthly M&M conference through that. So your institution uh, should have a HIPAA-compliant WebEx availability, and that's just something that um, we, we will want to make sure that your institution allows that um, to happen. Uh, but certainly I, I do think there are uh, ways to do that um, uh, quite easily, right, uh, toggling between presentations and things. Other folks, um, uh, for example, we've converted at, at UVA, uh, we've converted our tumor boards into this format. So I, I ran a tumor board today with our oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, and, and it was quite easy to switch through um, different speakers and looking at imaging and things and having the radiologist present the imaging from their desktop. It was um, uh, uh, quite easy and straightforward. 
Uh, obviously, there's going to be some growing pains as you go to this online curriculum. But our hope is that um, hopefully we've made it painless enough um, as you start adopting this that maybe after all is said and done, uh, which certainly we're going to have an end to this, that maybe some of these things might be valuable enough to incorporate into the program if the content is, is really good. Um, we hope that some of it might stick. Uh, certainly not all of it. Uh, as I said, I think person-to-person -person interaction and direct communication and meetings obviously are always ideal, but when you can't have that or don't want that all the time, or the content just isn't as good unless you have um, uh, certain types of speakers, maybe some of these modalities will help with that. Well, I think with that, um, Megan, if there's no other uh, questions, I do want to clarify two things. Number one is the code is 2020 capital R lowercase e s. So it's lowercase e and s. So 2020 res, but with a capital R lowercase e s. The second thing is um, the, the um, website is cns.org slash um, online ed, so online, O-N-L-I-N-E-E-D. Thanks, everybody, for participating, and have a great evening. Stay safe. Thanks, Ashok. Thanks, Garney. Thanks, Lola. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Miriam.